So normally I'm a um, China scholar, but for this uh, um, uh, presentation, I wanted to uh, write about the representation of abortion in post-communist Romanian film, uh, which is my native country, uh, and also about women's reproductive agency and the abortion ban in uh, communist uh, Romania. Um, now, the reason that I chose this topic is because we see around the world, especially in the United States and in some countries in Eastern Europe, an attack on abortion uh, rights. And um, I think it's very important that um, we address this uh, topic historically, but also how it's represented in uh, film culture. So uh, this paper investigates the representation of back alley abortions in post-communist Romanian film and documentary and unpacks the history of trauma of banning abortions during the socialist period in, uh, between 1966 and 1989 in Romania. Despite the traumatic effect, state control of women's reproduction meant for Romanian women, these pro-natalist policies seem to attract little media attention. This paper also further investigates uh, the subjectivity of illicit abortion survivors, but also considered the thousands of victims, women dying as a result of complications resulting from unsafe abortions. In my paper, I show how Decree 770 that banned abortion changed the gynecological profession. Doctors who had been able to perform abortions legally were no longer allowed to do so between 1965 and 1989. Furthermore, their professional duties now including monitoring women's fertility outside of the hospitals in state institutions like factories by performing mandatory gynecological exams. At the same time, gynecological, gynecologists had to deal with the severe interference in their medical duties enacted by the secret police. Securitate in Romanian and also the prosecutors. Uh, the worrisome trend of dem demedicalization of abortion also occurred in the absence of a legal framework allowing abortions to take place in hospitals. And that's one of our uh, Romanian women's reproductive as Romanian communist ideologues' obsession with natality, children as the future of socialism, and the new man ideology and free children of a particular class and ethnicity uh, clashed with uh, what I call uh, women's reproductive burdens, uh, which I think is a far more compelling category to explain women's reproductive choices in socialism than the Western concept of reproductive rights. Because if you, there is no law to give you rights, I mean, uh, then it, that word is meaningless for so, uh, socialist women. Despite the traumatic if, uh, effects state control of women's reproduction meant for Romanian women during the socialist period, these pro-natalist policies seem to attract little uh, media attention in post-socialist Romania. One exception to this collective amnesia on pronatalism was the acclaimed Romanian art film, Four Months, Three Weeks, and Two Days, directed by Christian Mungiu, that won a Cannes Film Festival Award. Set in Yash in 1987, the action takes place in a single day. Gabita, a young student, undergoes an illegal abortion. Otilia, her friend, shows feminist solidarity and helps Gabi get a uh, an illicit abortion. Unfortunately, she falls prey to the abortionist who rapes her to enable the abortion. Otilia is not only traumatized by dealing with the after effects of the rape, but also has the hallucinatory task to get rid of the fetus in a place far away from the hotel where the abortion takes place. We are shown moving images of Otilia running to the night with the bagged fetus that she eventually throws in a garbage chute of an unknown apartment building. Um, these are captured in what can be called the flight and fright aesthetics. Most of the other characters are very negative, especially the predator and rapist Bebe. 
The film also captures well the details of life in socialist Romania, such as uh, the illegal uh, selling of uh, foreign cigarettes and contraceptive. Uh, now, uh, what's important is the abortion scene. Uh, we have a hypnotic discussion that occurs between uh, two friends uh, and the abortions about the detail of the abortions. Uh, Bebe inserts a catheter to induce abortion without anesthesia. Uh, Gabica asks about possible anesthesia. However, uh, because it's happening in a hotel room, that is not possible. Uh, Bebe is also not a real doctor. Uh, much of the discussion was about how to hide the abortion, uh, to be careful not to stain the sheets of the hotel with blood, and not to call an ambulance because of prison danger. Um, uh, when the women offer the abortion is money, he instead demands sexual intercourse with her friend in exchange for inducing the abortion. So Otilia agrees to the sexual exploitation to help her friend. Uh, we are not shown the rape scene. Instead, we see Gabica waiting in the bathroom for the ordeal to be over, and Otilia is thrown in the bathroom, uh, eager to uh, wash away any trace of the ordeal she endured. The abortion scene is harrowing. We are shown a close-up of the abortionist's bag of instruments and how he does his preparation. But the camera only shows part of his body so that his head is not visible, a short signifying the anonymity and secrecy of the procedure. And these are some pictures of uh, the abortion scene and the two female character and the abortionist uh, Bebe. Uh, now, um, we also see how Gabica digs a plastic bag out of the garbage, not to stain the hotel sheets, and how Bebe injects an abortifacient liquid for a catheter into her uterus. These reconstructive details of back alley abortions give chilly insights into the risky methods of inducing illicit abortions. Uh, his uh, instructions for the girls are equally starting to wait for the placenta and not cut the umbilical cord until it is out, not throw away the body fill it in the toilet, but to dispose of it a few blocks away. After he induces the abortion, Bebe conveniently leaves. Um, now, uh, to reconstruct uh, the scene of the abortion scene, uh, Mundiu, the director, brought a midwife to demonstrate how to insert a catheter in the uterus and how to induce uh, con con uh, contractions. Um, when, uh, uh, when she was demonstrating this procedure, she was actually smoking. When asked whether she felt that what she was doing was shocking. She replied nonchalantly that she had done hundreds, she had done abortions hundreds of times, had been to prison, then did it again. She even admitted to doing it to herself 12 to 14 times, and then continued to smoke to the consternation of the actors. So in the film, the character Gabita also smokes while lying in bed waiting for the abortion to start, a scene probably inspired by the midwife. Uh, nonchalant smoking. Uh, now about the characters, throughout the ordeal uh, to procure abortion, Gabita appears detached, sometimes fearful of Bebe, but not so much of the abortion process. Trauma causes her to be disconnected from her body. Though she's about to undergo a traumatizing procedure, Gabita shows frivolous concerns, such as waxing her legs, and shrinks from the responsibility of making her own arrangements with the shady Bebe. Instead, she places that burden on her roommate's shoulder, uh, who overcomes many obstacles to make the abortion happen. Her friend Otilia shows a sense of purpose, responsibility, and altruism, but also suffers from a trauma traumatic experience uh, that she eventually is unable to confront and wants to forget. Thus, Otilia's character has more depth. Otilia's solidarity with her roommate also comes out of a shared experience of pain. Uh, now, uh, the scene ends with a dinner uh, where they actually eat pork organs. Uh, and uh, that uh, scene uh, is meant to signify the savagery of the induced abortion experience. 
Now, uh, what's important here is to look at abortion as a way to reclaim women's bodies. The female characters in Jewish film and uh, in Japan's documented that I will talk about uh, immediately show reproductive agency, resisting the gaze of the government and of that of the secret police, who are actively scrutinizing their reproductive uh, bodies. Uh, this uh, uh, story is not of illicit abortion, it's not unique, but it's tragic in its ubiquity among uh, women in communist Romania, a country that had the most draconian population control policies in the world. Mungiu also shows how the underground abortion social networks work between procurers and providers. This film can also shed light into women's reproductive choices by informal means in a system that had no legal abortion option. Uh, so in this film, back alley abortions and self-induced abortion become a way of reclaiming Romanian women's bodies from the state and were kind of an attempt at self-empowering. Uh, they're not just victims, right? Uh, the illicit abortion theme is representative of women's reproductive experiences in communist Romania. So women's agency in making reproductive choices is important here. Now, um, of course, I also want to discuss uh, another uh, documentary called Children of the Dead Sea that documents pronatalism, uh, but also has uh, in, uh, treated other themes such as policing abortions, eugenics, and the new socialist men. Um, now, the coercive uh, pronatalist policies uh, of socialist Romania hinged on the role of women's reproduction for socialist construction. In 1966, the Romanian Communist Party passed Decree 770, which effectively prohibited abortion, a decree that would be in place until 1989. And not only was abortion illegal, but contraception was also not widely available and had become a taboo topic. A pro pro-natalist propaganda was very aggressive to enforce this law. Uh, in the multinational documentary Children of the Decree, the Romanian director Yepan, Florin Yepan, explores Ceausescu's pro-natalist policies by subvertively just opposing official propaganda images with a series of um, interviews with medical professionals, uh, abortionists, and women who experience back alley abortions. So this is a picture of Nicolae Ceausescu, uh, uh, the Romanian dictator, and a uh, picture always with a lot of babies. You know, he loves children. Uh, and of course, the children of the decree subversively uses some of these propaganda images to shed a critical light on his legacy. Uh, he also was famous for having pioneers, uh, you know, do shows, propaganda shows for him and his wife. Now, um, famous women from that time period, such as TV presenter Delia Budano and fashion model Zina Dumitrescu, recount their experiences with illicit abortion. Um, and uh, for example, Zina Dumitrescu hardly recounted how she screamed for an abortion performed on her own kitchen table. Um, another female patient told the story of how she had an abortion done by a mechanic that was subsequently arrested. Yapan also interviews a nurse who described the fear of interrogation women felt in maternity wards and how she advised them to keep silent. So what was happening was that the male dominated secret police and the medical establishment all monitored and controlled women's fertility. Uh, women suspected of inducing abortion were often threatened with arrest and were harassed and beaten to confess who helped them. Uh, a female doctor uh, in this documentary tells the story of a German minority woman who died as a result of a botched abortion, but who refused to give away the person name who helped her, despite knowing that she was going to die. Uh, so uh, scholars like Maria Bucur and Florentina Andreescu consider abortions during this communist period as dissident acts. 
Uh, now it's important to look at doctors and militia monitoring uh, the fertility of female patients and female workers. Doctors performing legal abortions were imprisoned if caught. The militia was in charge of the hostel and gynecology wards, which further encumbered both the female patients and the medical professionals who were under constant monitoring. Uh, doctors interviewed by Yapan also stripped factory women naked in large groups and forcefully checked for pregnancy. So in fact, this documentary recaptures part of the reproductive trauma felt by women. Uh, on its premiere, the um, documentary was shown uh, at, uh, in a factory at Postavaria Romana on a Romanian national television with the debate afterwards in which the Minister of Culture, Mona Musca, cried and asked the female factory workers how many experienced similar stories. All of the women present there lifted their hands. Uh, so these tears could be the tears of any woman who experienced those years. Uh, so this is a picture from the documentary, which also shows the deadly consequences of this law, such as loss of life, especially in the aseptic world, infertility, and also other medical complications. Um, now, the documentary was commissioned by Discovery Germany, and this was the only slot available to Eastern European historical topics. Japan's comparison um, um, of Ceausescu's project of social engineering to Hitler's um, uh, eugenic policies and the Übermensch ideology initially shocked German broadcasters. So how Japan uh, did this film is he used montage and image retrieval from the National Television Archive uh, to subversively mix official footage with films from the socialist period. Um, in terms of his motivation as a documentarian, he seems to be wanting to tell the truth of history, but also telling stories that are compelling, impacted people's lives historically, yet had become forgotten in history. Japan also relies on oral history as a method to counter the narratives coming out of the official television archives, whose images he reads against the grain. Now I wanna talk about eugenics and population control in socialism, especially about the new man ideology, which he really emphasizes in the documentary. Um, so Japan makes uh, provocative documentaries that play pay close attention to the consequences of applying eugenic ideology to population policies. And I myself am a scholar of eugenics in China and global eugenics. So I uh, am very interested in this uh, part of the documentary. Because in fact, the new communist regime of Ceausescu continues some of the eugenicist dreams that uh, resurrected in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, at the same time, the fall of the communist regime in 1989 came a revelation of mistreatment of handicapped orphans, which also attests to the remnants of eugenics and the association with the new socialist man ideology and pronatalist policy. Meanwhile, in communist Romania, Ceausescu's disdain for handicapped children, despite his great love for children, is evidence for the existence of the so-called deaf orphanages at Sigetul Marmati in Maramureș County and Chigid in Bihor County, where a hundred children died in only two years. Basically, children with disability were left to die because um, the regime didn't think they were salvageable. Um, of course, the documentary also makes a connection uh, with the 1989 revolution by uh, showing the sad story of Radu Postavaro, a five-year-old prodigy conductor who uh, was praised in the socialist media. Uh, of course, uh, this is all about uh, eugenics too because it's about genius, right? Uh, so following up the story of the prodigy child, Radu Yapan shows that Radu later turned against Ceausescu and died at the revolution in 1989. So one interesting interpretation of Japan is that he connected the generation of children born as a result of Decree 770 with the revolution of 1989. So Japan suggests that the driving competition resulting from having such high numbers of students in school uh, resulted in a generation that was ambitious and that wanted change and ultimately brought about the downfall of uh, dictator Ceausescu. 
So these are some pictures of the Romanian Revolution uh, where about 3,000 people died. And as a result of this revolution, the Ceausescu couple was sentenced to death and executed for genocide. Uh, I also want to discuss how Japan use, uses subversively a banned documentary, One Day Will Come, uh, directed by uh, Moscow Kopel. To criticize the communist uh, regime's obsession with children, Japan also used subversive footage from a 1984 censored documentary directed by Moscow Kopel, a documentary about a turkey farm. Japan wants to question the validity of the new man ideology, so he juxtaposes images from the banned documentary to these images of the deaf orphanages I mentioned before. Far from talking about turkeys, it was actually referring to the new eugenic policies surrounding children. Moscow's film uses montage of images of poles from the turkey factory hatching out of the eggs, images of a classical orchestra, and images of, from a kindergarten where children learn about classical music to talk about a new generation of children. While showing turkeys in the factory, the narrator talks of problems related to life of people in socialist, hierarchies in collectivity, conflicts, when this hierarchy is disrupted, evolution, social behavior, discipline in factories, Japanese work ethic, and women's labor. Uh, and of course, uh, these are pictures from that band documentary that show uh, uh, the juxtaposing of what you see here of uh, the deaf orphanages, children in the kindergartens, and the turkeys. This is just the image of what I've been telling you. Uh, of course, this documentary, banned documentary, is about the tragedy of eugenic selection in socialism. Uh, Japan interprets this banned documentary as being about the extermination of those born with deficiencies, the tragedy of selection, and socialist eugenic policies toward children. Uh, the communist state was an intense nationalist state that emphasized patriotism. So, for example, gypsies uh, that are a minority were allowed to have abortions because they were not wanted by the regime and they were banned from being shown on TV. Uh, so the documentary bold, boldly states that, in fact, this policy became a project of ethnic cleansing and also demonstrates uh, Japan's commitment to intersectionality. Uh, of course, um, the clandestine abortions were also motivated by the scarce availability of food in the 80s. Used to buy food were ubiquitous because Romania paid off its foreign debt of $1 billion. Medical supplies were also insufficient in 1980s socialist Romania. So as a result of this shortage, Romanian doctors had to use the 19th century Gallimanini pregnancy test that utilized the reaction of male frogs that came into contact with female urine to determine pregnancy. So they used this test in court to prosecute women who induced abortion. But a daughter interviewed by Japan state that due to overuse, not only were frogs exhausted, but eventually they could not find enough frogs to perform this test. So the anachronistic use of the Gallimanini pregnancy test underscores deprivation of the Romanian socialist medical system in the 1980s. Uh, so this is a picture with cues from uh, for me in the 1980s. Some of these I experienced as a child. Uh, so deprived of other contraceptive means, women in socialist Romania secretly and desperately induced air, mustard, plants, antibiotic, lemon zest into the vagina, or took hot baths, applied hot bricks to their backs, and drank alcohol. Women procured abortions by preparing money envelopes, by laying impermeable tablecloths, boiling water, and saying passwords through open doors. Women also induce sharp objects into vaginas to induce hemorrhage, such as spindles, needles, crochets, but also deadly plants such as horseradish, uh, St. John's wharf, lovar, stem, so other normal plants that are not deadly. Uh, the abortionists could be anybody, the dentist, the mechanic, the midwife, uh, Japan inter even interviews an abortionist woman, Trandafira Ionescu, who defiantly stated that she had performed more abortions than she had hairs in her head. Uh, Trandafira charged the rich 5,000 lei and the poor nothing in exchange for an abortion. Women like her also who helped other women by performing clandestine abortions show both feminist solidarity resistance to the state, uh, but also help women exert their reproductive agency. 
So in conclusion, Romanian women show resistance to the state control of their reproduction by accessing a very deadly and dangerous system of illegal back alley abortions, often performed by people with lack of medical training. This resulted in an astonishing maternity death rate. It is estimated that 25,000 women died because of illegal abortion. Decree 770 represents a tightening of the state's control over women's reproduction. Women had to perform both reproductive as well as domestic work to sustain the socialist economy. Significant effort went into evading the authorities from the police, the prosecutors, the doctors that were compelled to inform them. The material limitations are also very important for why women chose abortion. The death of despair that women felt comes across in the doctors' and nurses' testimonies, in their description of their deaths, their sufferings, humiliations, and their interrogation by state authorities. Romanian women's subjectivity during the communist period was steeped into their painful reproductive experiences, entailing not only abortion without anesthesia, but also horrific complication. The female characters in all of these documentaries and films occupy different positionalities as actors of their own destiny, reproducers and caretakers, often simultaneously being both villains and victims. Munjiu and Yapan uh, are all concerned with remembering women's reproductive experiences in communist Romania. Um, and that's all. Thank you so much for uh, listening.